How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We are fantastic here at my household. School was out on Friday. Lucky. And you just have a week. That's I know, it. It's just a week. Your son so... graduates tomorrow. Hey, I'm telling you, I'm not going to believe it till it's there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> hand. Hand. Yeah. Yeah. It'll it happen. Ha- has to now. We have people coming today. Well, so, it doesn't yeah. have to, but it will happen. They would tell you by now if it doesn't. But anyway, you are you are you ready? And speaking of summer, I've got something that's kind of set in the summer. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Do tell. Let's go. All right. The aroma of hot dogs, churros, and fried Twinkies waft over the fairgrounds. The bright lights, some flashing, some remaining solid with bright color are dazzling to the fairgoer. The sounds of children laughing, carnival workers barking at the crowds to come play a game, bells dinging, the echo of rides spinning and rolling is what draws the community of Barton County to the annual fair. Gotta love a fair. I love it. It reminds me of my childhood. I love yeah, it. One of the best things is always taking the kids to the fair. And when my daughter was little, she would always want a, a funnel cake. She would always want a funnel cake, but she'd want extra funnel. Oh, that's right. I remember. Mm-hmm. That powdered the- sugar. She wanted extra powdered sugar, but she called that the funnel. Because <laughs> it's cake. <laughs> I wanted funnel. extra funnel. I get it. Yeah. I get yeah. it. Totally makes sense. That's so cute. I love it. Yeah. Now for Pauline and Alfred, otherwise known as Sonny Carpenter, going to the Barton County Fair in Great Bend, Kansas, was a chance to sell their homemade goods. Before Sonny retired, he worked at the Boeing Aircraft Company. Now. After 32 years of marriage to Pauline, he was making arts and crafts and selling them with the love of his life. Aside from their crafting, they seldom had time to be bored. Their huge family consisted of five daughters, one son, 18 grandkids, and 32 great-grandchildren, a brood big enough to entertain even the most active seniors. Sonny and Pauline, both in their late 70s, made jewelry, purses, and other crafts. And from their home from Wichita, the couple would pack up their one-ton Dodge Ram truck, camper, and trailer with their handmade goods and drive to different fairs, festivals, and carnivals selling their wares. Their camper was a home away from home. It allowed them to sleep comfortably and stay at longer events. I would love to do that when I get older. I think that would be super fun. Sell crafts at fairs? No, get an RV and just go around the world continent <laughs> around the world in an rv that'd be kind of hard hey, it's going to be one of those duck boat things that can be on land like kirby the love bug yes exactly yes. Mm-hmm. okay on the morning of july 11th 2018 sunny and pauline were packed up and ready to go the truck and trailer was packed up full with items to sell along with tables and chairs display racks you know anything that they would need to have a successful craft show it was a two-hour drive to Barton County Fairgrounds, and the fair didn't open until 5 p.m., but they liked setting up their booth early because it gave them a chance to relax, maybe even catch a nap before they had to tend to their booth. Although they had been doing this for several years, Sunny and Pauline were excited. This was one of the bigger events that they liked to attend, and they hoped that they would sell a lot of items. This was their last year of doing this. They were planning to retire and get out of the business, and they wanted to pretty much get rid of all their inventory, along with selling the truck, camper, and trailer. 
Oh, see, they're doing the opposite of what I would do. I was going to well, reti- retire be 80. and do that. But yeah. yeah, you know what I'm she saying. She did retire, and that's what they did for a while. And it was yeah. just time to kind of pack it up and, you know, go enjoy all those grandkids and great-grandkids. The carnival part of the fair had already moved into the fairground several days prior to opening. The big rig trucks carried in rides that delight children of all ages. You know, and there's the carnival games where goofy teenagers might try to win their date, a stuffed animal. Oh, and don't forget the booths of food where you're guaranteed to get clogged arteries. It was all there, including the carnival employees. Some people that work at carnivals, more affectionately called carnies, have been ostracized by their families, so they find working the carnival circuit a place where they are welcome. They feel welcomed and accepted. Many of these people have lived, traveled, and worked together for years. They become friends, lovers, and even family to each other. The life of a carny can be a nomadic lifestyle. They spend three to five days in a city before moving on to the next town. Carnies even have their own secret language. They use it to speak to one another so the general public won't know what they're saying. For example, a mark or a mooch means it's an easy target and they can scam them into spending money. A joint is a booth that's in the midway. And a Larry is anything broken. Or instead of calling someone a loser, they might call him a Larry. Like, hey, Larry, come on up and play this game. You can find a long list of carny terms and phrases online for anyone who might be interested. Another thing carnies adhere to is their own code, which is simply don't trust outsiders. Take care of our own. It's us against the world. We are kindred spirits and we must look out for each other. One carny. 52-year-old Kimberly Younger had a hunger. Ha ha, see, that rhymed. (laughs) She hungered for power and respect, and she got it. How, you ask? She was part of the carnival mafia. She answered to a mob boss, a man named Frank Zaychek. She told her 54-year-old romantic partner, Michael Fowler Jr., all about it. And once their carny friends heard about how great Kimberly had it by being in this mafia, they were anxious to be a part of the mob, and they wanted badly for Kimberly to get them in. Because everyone knows the mafia protects and takes care of their own. It's a sweet deal. Kimberly told Michael, 35-year-old Rusty Frazier, 37-year-old Christine Tenney, and 31-year-old Thomas Drake that she would talk to the big mod boss, Frank Zaychek and see if maybe he would be interested in adding this ragtag group into the fold. Frank, as it turned out, was very interested and sent a text over Facebook Messenger to Michael Fowler Jr. and the rest of this carny crew. But first, before they could get in, they would have to be initiated into this mob. They had to prove that they were worthy. They needed a blood in. Frank said their initiation was to kill a couple of elderly vendors. He went on to tell the crew that their hit was a carpenter's, and they would be selling their crafts at the Barton County Fair. And it just so happened to be the same fair that they were all to be working. And once it was done, once Sonny and Pauline were killed, they were to send pictures to Frank so he could see that it was done, just for proof. Then he'd know if he could trust them to be a part of this carny mob family. Saturday, the 14th of July, the fair was in full throttle. Only one more day of events and the Barton County Fair would be closing down for the next year. Vendors will be packing up to travel back to their homes and the carnies would close down the rides and booths to soon be back on the road, taking a trip to their next destination. That night, late after the carnival had closed, Michael Fowler Jr., Rusty Frazier, and Kimberly Younger snuck up to the carpenter's parking spot in the fairground lot. Sonny was awake. He was outside checking on something in his truck. Kimberly walked up and distracted him, and Michael crept up behind Sonny and put him in a chokehold. He then tried to slit Sonny's throat. When Sonny fought back, Rusty stabbed Sonny in the chest. Then Michael pulled out his 9 millimeter Rutger and shot Sonny twice in the head killing him. Kimberly then told Michael to, quote, go take care of the wife. 
Michael entered the camper where Pauline was still sleeping and shot her twice in the head. Michael, Kimberly, and Rusty moved Sonny's body to the camper with Pauline's. At around 2.20 in the morning, Michael texted mod boss Frank while Kimberly went back to her quarters to change. Here's the text. Michael, it's done, they're dead. Frank, good job, get out now. Michael, I'm trying to calm down a bit right now. Frank, deep breaths. The first is always the hardest. Mm. Jen sent me pictures of the man, and I sent it to the heads of council. The war is over. And at this point, we're not really sure who Jen is supposed to be and why, how she had pictures. Frank sends out a text to the other Carney Mafia wannabes and tells them to get over the carpenter's camper to clean it up immediately. And then they are to dispose of the bodies. Following Frank's orders, the new members of the Carney Mob family cleaned up the camper and drove six hours to Van Buren, Arkansas, near the Arkansas National Forest. The group went to stay with Michael's daughter while they figured out their next move. Two days later, three of the new Carney Mafia members, Michael, Rusty, and Kimberly, drove Sonny's pickup truck out to the Ozark National Forest. They found a dry creek bed and dug a shallow grave to bury the bodies of Sonny and Pauline Carpenter. Michael and Kimberly, once back at the apartment complex, raided the camper. They went through all of the carpenter's possessions, making sure they took whatever cash and items they found of worth from the elderly couple. When everything was done, the small Carney mob family went back to the apartment, where Kimberly made everyone a nice spaghetti dinner, and they all talked and laughed and had a great time that night. Back in Wichita... Sonny and Pauline's family were starting to get worried. They hadn't come back from the Barton County Fair, and neither one of them were answering their cell phones. Soon, one of the daughters called the police and reported the elderly couple missing. On July 18th, things started to unravel for the newly initiated Carney Mob family. While still at Michael's daughter's apartment, Christine Tenney called her sister-in-law who lived in Wichita, Kansas, which, by the way, was the same city that the Carpenters were from. Christine told her that she had been kidnapped by fellow carnival workers and was being held against her will in a Van Buren, Arkansas apartment complex. She also told her sister-in-law that the Carnies that were holding her captive had also murdered an elderly couple. And the sister-in-law did what any good person would do in this situation, She called the Van Buren Police Department and told them what Christine had told her. On July 19th, 2018, the police tracked down the Carnival Mafia at the Vista Hills Apartments. When they talked to Christine and asked if she had been kidnapped, she was insistent that she was there on her own free will. When looking around the apartment complex, they saw, parked outside, the camper belonging to the carpenters. There were bullets holes in that camper. Inside, officers found trash bags that contained bloody paper towels, blood-soaked clothing that belonged to the carpenters, a blood-splattered sleep apnea machine, and two 9mm spent casings. They also found a red backpack, which, when asked, Kimberly Younger identified as hers. Looking through it, they found the 9mm Rutger handgun. When the authorities spoke with Kimberly, she didn't want to use her real name at first. When she did, I'm guessing, she used the name Myrna Khan. And I say this only because in one of the articles that I found, one of the very first articles on this case, when it listed everybody that was arrested, brought into questioning, the name Myrna Khan was there. And it wasn't Kimberly until later. And another article that I found said that another name she used was Tiffany Jones. So she gave the police three names before she actually gave them her real name. And, of course, Kimberly, when asked, told the police that she was part of the Carnival Mafia, which involved money laundering and murder. So police then start questioning Kimberly about the Carpenters. And, of course, she tells them how nice she was that she took Sonny and Pauline to a car rental place so they could go to a casino. And, you know, she just couldn't seemed to recall what that car rental place was, where it was at, what it was called. She Mm -hmm. knew nothing. Mm -hmm. 
So Kimberly, Michael, Rusty, Christine, and Thomas were all brought in one at a time for questioning. Michael Fowler Jr. sang like a canary. He laid out all the details explaining that killing the Carpenters was their initiation to the Carnival Mafia that was run by boss Frank Zaychek. It was all planned out over texts. Michael said that they chose the Carpenters as targets for a crime because they were easy. Christine and Michael both told police where they could find the remains of Sonny and Pauline. Lieutenant Patty Stroud from the Crawford County, Arkansas Sheriff's Office and another officer followed a map that the two had drawn that had the location of Sonny and Pauline's remains. The map led them to a rural area off Star Road in Crawford County. The smell of decomposing bodies led them to a shallow grave. Lieutenant Stroud said, quote, we collected the evidence in layers. There was layers of tree limbs, then large rocks, a mattress with bedding, and then more rocks. Finally, the bodies of the carpenters were found lying face down next to each other. So now the police start looking for Frank Zaychek. They're not having much luck finding him. While interviewing Kimberly Younger, Van Buren police officer, Sergeant Daniel Perry, is given permission by Kimberly to look through her phone. He starts scrolling through her social media accounts and bingo, there on Facebook Messenger, they found all the information they need to arrest Kimberly and the family. Sergeant Perry discovered that Kimberly was really Frank Zaychek. Really? She had set up Facebook accounts under the name Frank Zaychek. All the texts were there. Kimberly was the mastermind. She was the real-life Kaiser Sose from The Usual Suspects, except she got caught. She was the mastermind. Whole thing. That's... Mm, Okay. Just wait. (laughs) When detectives told Michael that there was no Frank Zaychek or Carnival Mafia and that he had been suckered by Kimberly, he was devastated, just totally crestfallen. And he told detectives, quote, she had me suckered the whole effing way and I just threw away my whole life. He really did. He but did. I they were questions. dating for years. But, ooh. Hmm, okay. Or wow. married, but I think they were just dating. Yeah, the fictitious carnival mafia, just to, there is no such thing as a carnival mafia, just like there's no Amish mafia. There's. Yes, there is. I've seen the TV show. Oh, uh huh. Cause they're never going to be lying on TV. Mm-mm. No, it's all the truth. Just like the internet. Yep. It's not true. Police are very adamant in saying that there is no carnival mafia, but the fictitious carnival mafia under the lead of Kimberly Younger, aka Frank Zaychek, a.k.a. Myrna Khan, a.k.a. Tiffany Jones, a.k.a. Jenna Roberts, was extradited back to Kansas. Kind of the same thing. I want to tell you something real quick. Thomas Drake of Van Buren, Kansas, pleaded guilty to one count of obstruction apprehension. I couldn't find anything about what his sentencing was. Christine Tenney of La Marquette, Texas, pleaded guilty to one count of aggravated robbery and one count of obstructing apprehension. Christine's sentence was for 65 months in prison, so roughly five and a half years. Rusty Frazier of Arkansas Pass, Texas, now he's the one that stabbed Sonny in the chest. He took a plea deal and agreed to testify against Kimberly Younger. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 50 years on each of two counts of first-degree murder, and the sentences are to run consecutively. And Michael Fowler, the one that was dating Kimberly? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was also charged with two counts of premeditated first degree murder and capital murder and robbery. And listen to this at Kimberly Young's preliminary hearing, Michael said he had been dating Kimberly Younger for a few years prior to the murders, but he thought her name was Jenna Roberts. Uh, what? 
So yes. <laughs> so remember when Frank said, "Oh, Jen sent me the pictures." <gasps> That's yes. who Jen is. Hmm. Oh wow, man. Oof. Could you imagine the person's not really who you think they are, but then they're like really not who you think they are. They're not like who she. They think they are. I mean, she's got four, five aliases now. You would think that you would be, let's say, in the throes of passion. <laughs> He, he would say, Kim, Kim. And she, you know, but she'd being be a like, carny, she could be whoever she wanted, right? Yeah, I guess. Seriously. That's and weird. as he left the courtroom from that preliminary hearing, Michael told Sonny and Pauline's daughter, Christy Yilly, you know, he walked by and apologized, said, I'm so sorry. Michael did plead guilty and he took a plea deal in exchange for testifying against Kimberly Younger. Michael was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for a hundred years to run consecutively. He was also sentenced to 21 months for theft to run concurrently. Huh. Now, while the other four carnies pled guilty, they wanted trials without a jury and they've already been sentenced and are serving their time. Kimberly Younger, however, maintains her not guilty status and wants a jury trial. She's been charged with two counts of premeditated first-degree murder, capital murder, conspiracy to commit murder, criminal solicitation, and felony theft. Her trial has been postponed due to her defense researching this case. And then, of course, COVID. Well, if Kimberly Jenna was smart, she would ask the judge if possibly each of her identities could help serve. <laughs> so then she'd mm-hmm. be out in a while. Probably, well, maybe. Maybe, but if it's consecutively, yeah, it's probably not. But anyway, her trial set to begin in early September of this year, so we'll keep you posted. There's no words. I don't... I Can you I, imagine no. not only having no. somebody you've been dating for years not, it not be their real name, and there's no reason to kill this couple. I mean, as far as anybody can tell, Kimberly had no beef with Sonny and Pauline Carpenter. Do you they think it was like um, just a, an easy target? But do you think it was a like she wanted to see if Michael would do what she demanded? Sort of like, let's see how much you love me. I'm going to make you kill these people. And then why it. do it under the guise of a mafia boss? I don't know. You would think Michael would have looked into that a little bit more, but I could be wrong. Would a mafia boss really do everything over Facebook Messenger? <laughs> no. Seriously? No. I mean, I got a I got a violation on Facebook because I posted something f- six years ago about Frozen, the movie Disney movie Frozen. Oh, really? And, yeah, and they do read all your texts. I mean, you can get violations over texts over Messenger too. But seriously, why? Wow. Hold on, I've got to get this Messenger text from my mob boss that I have never met. That I've never met. And, oh, and you know, I the, did want to say that when the I, Washington Post article, the police never found anything about a Frank Zaychuk even existed. Washington Post did find that there is a Frank Zaychuk, but it's spelled differently. And he's in Michigan. He runs a carnival group. Oh, um, so she she they, researched a name to try probably, to make it. Probably, yeah. yeah. And the guy, when they mentioned him, he's like, oh, my God, this is bone chilling that somebody would because I couldn't imagine that at all. And the police, there's absolutely no, it's not him, Kimberly. There's no reason that it's this man in Michigan. But he's like, I've never heard of these people. I don't think they've ever worked for us. Well, and wow. how would he know if Kimberly worked for them? Because she's got so many aliases. <laughs> but still, I couldn't imagine, you know, the Washington Post calling you up saying, hey, <laughs> your name has been used as a mob boss to kill two Nice, Not just sweet, a mob elderly. boss, Jen. A carny mob a boss. Carney That's mob even boss. better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just bizarre. Oh. And I also want to thank our podcast friend and actually just friend all around, CJ from Beyond the Rainbow podcast. Thanks, she CJ. actually put all this together for me. Um, she found the story and she liked it. But since she, her podcast is only LGBTQ podcast, she wanted this to be mentioned. So she just wrote up a draft for me and that's took amazing. it from there. She's That's awesome. A sweetheart. And she also said she didn't want any credit for it, but I said tough. 
because she did You're the work. Credit. She needs You're credit. credit. Hello, credit. We don't take things that are <laughs> that isn't ours. We're without not permission. like other people who shall remain nameless. Who? But, but no, see, they we they, they blatantly an steal. awful lot. Yeah. But because I had never heard, and this is just in Kansas. You know, well, it's so bizarre. You would think you would hear about it because yeah. it's it's fine. a TV movie. It's a lifetime movie. Uh, could you imagine the characters too? They would be. You could really have up some good. I mean, not just them, but the carnival characters. You oh, know? yeah, Make no, it really I, interesting. It's it was an interesting case, but the whole thing. I was like reading it, and I'm like, Jen, Jen sent pictures. Who the hell's Jen? You know, and war. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. what war? There was no war. It was just an initiation. They Poor had Michael. to spill blood. Well, you know, they wanted that power for some reason. I don't know if she it was did. more. If well, m- I mean, I guess he did too, but, you know, wow. I mean, I he's know. guilty. He did it for whatever reason. He did it, and he knows he is. That's why he pleaded guilty, He and he apologized. To th- I mean, he was, from every article I read, he was shook that, when he found out Frank wasn't real. Well, I would not. And then Kim, like, talk about double, triple, quadruple whammy. Betrayal. <laughs> you're with somebody for years and, wait, your name's not really Kim? It's right. what? Mm-hmm. But no, she had fake books, a uh, uh, fake book, listen to me. She had Facebook accounts Same set thing. up. Yeah. With all these different profiles. And she was messaging people. So she for really those played profiles. This, played oh, yeah. It was for a while. Really? Yeah. Well, I don't know if she planned out the murder, but she planned something. Oh, she did. If she did all the, fa- you know, tying mm-hmm. it all together, making sure everything ties together with her fake mob boss. And then fight. she went ahead and, sorry, it had to be really dumb to let police go through my, your phone. If they're able to get on Facebook, uh, you give them the passwords without them even having to work for it or even a search warrant. Mm-hmm. They're going to find mm-hmm. shit. Excuse my language, but they're going to find things. <laughs> Um, Big dummy. She, oh, yeah, that's my red back, backpack with the gun in it. Go ahead and look at it. I mean, what are you going to say? No, that's not my red backpack. I don't know how that got in my place. I don't know whose that is, right? She so, could have. So. Yeah. Why but, not? She's the only one that's still saying not guilty. She's the one that started I all know. of it. I know. Well, that was a good one. I would love to see that made into a TV movie, but oh. that's because I like that kind of stuff. You know. It's bizarre. Super bizarre. Totally bizarre. Hey, Jen, we have any promos? We do. It is our utter, utter bestie, bestie October pod VHS. I love him. You guys know him. He is the listener discretion at the beginning of every single one of our episodes that I believe we, I think there's only a handful at the very beginning. He does a great horror YouTube channel named October Pod VHS. Cam and I have both done voices for him, so we really strongly urge you, please beg you to go check him out on YouTube. You'll he's love him. Trust me. He's he's, he's got awesome. the best voice. He really does. Mm-hmm. So listen to his promo, then go check him out on YouTube. And also, while we're, you know, doing things, I beg of you also, if you like us, please tell your friends and family about us. Yes, please. Please we do that. We kind of need a little bump. little bump. Hey, Jen. Yep. Don't forget, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Oh, bye-bye. Love ya. I'm Edward October, and I'm here at the October Pod Ranch in the Great Smoky Mountains. Almost every night here, there's a ghost story party around the campfire. In my family, we believe that scary stories are best told around a roaring fire with a bottle of wine. That's why bold individualists everywhere choose October Pod for their retro horror thrills. Our stories are so good because they're told with such care. Understated. Moody 
and above all, chilling. Why don't you join us for retro horror of impeccable taste? Choose Octoberpod. Find us on YouTube or at octoberpodvhs.com. Octoberpod. Retro horror for bold individualists. <laughs>